Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs in the Paranormal. As you know, I love exploring the more unusual aspects of UFO contact and that's what I'd really like to do today. The topic I'm going to discuss is something I bet you've probably not heard of before. Maybe you have, but I don't think so. I know it really shocked me. The title of today's episode is Extraterrestrial Hitchhikers. Yes, you heard right, alien hitchhikers. And I mean that literally. These are cases in which people have been driving along highways, and this is all over the world, and picked up people who turned out not to be human. This is in some ways related to the very well-known phenomena, phantom hitchhikers, and in those cases, people pick up a hitchhiker, which usually vanishes, disappears, and these are probably ghosts. What I'm going to be talking about are extraterrestrials, not ghosts. And I became interested in this after hearing about a few cases, decided to do a deeper dive and see if I could find more, and I did. I was surprised to find over a dozen cases. So yes, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I think these cases have something really interesting to say about the UFO phenomenon. They're really unusual. They, again, occur all over the world involving different types of ETs, um, as you'll see. And uh, I'd like to take you sort of on a journey through time, starting with the earliest cases, which occurred in the 1950s all the way up to about 2018, I think is the most recent case. So I've got a lot of cases I want to present to you today, and let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk to you about occurred actually in Santa Monica in Southern California. This was involving a man by the name of Virgil E. Atkinson, and it occurred in 1956. Virgil E. Atkinson is a military officer from Port Wainimi Naval Base. And as Virgil says in his own words about what happened to him, and I quote, I swear to you, what I am about to share with you is truth. While he was in the military, Virgil Atkinson says he's had multiple experiences with apparent extraterrestrials. I just want to tell you about the first one. His first encounter occurred again in 1956. He had just met a girl in Santa Monica, California, and was driving with her to Port Wainimi Naval Base. This is likely along the Pacific Coast Highway, which, by the way, has many, many cases of UFO encounters. I mean, you can't go a mile along this highway without running into a case. At any rate, Virgil was driving with his girlfriend when they saw two young sailors hitchhiking. And being in the military himself, Virgil decided to pick up the two sailors and give them a lift. But he was shocked when they got inside because they looked very young. He guessed that they couldn't have been more than 15 years old and he became suspicious that they were truly sailors. And he asked them where they were heading. And one of them replied, the Coos Head Naval Facility in Charleston, Oregon. Now Virgil hadn't heard of this facility, which in fact at that time had been newly commissioned. Coincidentally or not, he would later be assigned there but he continued to drive a few miles down the road and then arrived at his turnoff and pulled over to let the sailors exit, which they did. And after letting the sailors out, he resumed driving. They had just gotten back on the road and turned the corner, and that's when they came upon a large UFO hovering over the center of the road. Uh, Virgil drove right up to it when suddenly it disappeared he continued driving and looking back in his mirror, he was shocked to see that the UFO was now back and now appeared to be following them. He was about to stop, but his girlfriend became extremely frightened. She dropped to the floor of the car and began sobbing in fear. So he continued driving and this UFO followed close behind them. 
as they approached the lights of the city of Oxnard, which was some miles away, this object suddenly ascended at a 45 degree angle and disappeared into the night sky. Virgil Atkinson did call the police and report the sighting, and afterwards he felt certain that the sailors he had seen and picked up and the UFO were somehow connected, and now he wonders if the sailors were what they appeared to be, or if perhaps they were in fact extraterrestrials. And again, following this, one year later, Virgil Atkinson did find himself assigned to the newly commissioned Coos Bay facility. He was there from 1957 to 1959 and then was transferred. But it was while he was at this base that he had another encounter with what he believes were human-looking extraterrestrials. Now, I did cover this case in more detail in a previous episode, which I called E.T.'s teach people to build energy-free motors. So I'm not going to get into the whole case. I just really wanted to present the extraterrestrial hitchhiker aspect of it. But I will say that Virgil Atkinson believes he was taught all kinds of physics and how to build an energy-free motor, in so many words, <laughs> by these ETs. And in fact, he worked quite hard on it and did file patents with the U.S. Patent Office. So if you want, you can check that episode out. But important here is that Virgil Atkinson believes he picked up two gentlemen who may very well have been ETs. And again, as strange as this, this sounds, it is not unique. Yeah, a very unusual case. And there are so many more. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred in Lakewood, Colorado, to a gentleman who's anonymous. Uh, we only know him as Norman C. And his case occurred on October 10, 1967. This case is investigated by pioneering researcher Leo Sprinkle, who was then working for APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, Again, this occurred on October 10, 1967, when Norman C. was driving to his home near Lakewood, Colorado, when he was flagged down by a strange man that Norman described as being well over six feet in height. He had a forked goatee and was wearing a jacket with what looked like four gold bars on each shoulder. So of unusual in appearance and dress, Norman stopped, and the man began to, get this, communicate telepathically, and asked the main witness, Norman, where the North Star was and what date it was. So these were unusual questions, to say the least. Norman answered the questions, and the man replied, oh, in your primitive time, meaning what date it was. So at this time, Norman was smoking a cigarette, and this hitchhiker seemed puzzled by it and asked what it was. Norman told him what it was. It was a cigarette. And the man said, oh, one of your vices. Uh, the man then asked other weird questions, such as about Norman's car. Norman described it in detail. And the man said, oh, this is your primitive mode of transportation. So Norman was quite puzzled by all these weird questions and who this man was. So he asked him, who are you and where do you come from? And the hitchhiker replied, I cannot tell you now, but my colleagues and I will return. So at this point, uh, this gentleman walked away and disappeared. Norman heard a strange noise and looking up, he saw a glowing red object. It was huge, he said, about the size of a football field, and it made a loud whining noise, it proceeded to zoom straight up, joined two other objects, and disappeared at tremendous speed. The third case I'd like to talk to you about occurred in March of 1973, and this occurred outside of Mount St. Helens in Washington to a gentleman by the name of Frank Bales. That is a pseudonym. But this is a very interesting and unusual case involving two extraterrestrial hitchhikers. 
This next case comes from Lon Strickler, who runs the very popular Phantoms and Monsters website. He's a researcher and an author. And this case occurred in, again, March of 1973 to a gentleman I'll call Frank Bales. This is a pseudonym. He was 20 years old at the time and was visiting Mount St. Helens in Washington State, scouting the area for a future canoeing trip. He parked his car and decided to climb up the slopes of the mountain to a certain degree to obtain a better view. But shortly after beginning his hike, he had this weird fear sweep over him and he actually had this vivid premonition of the mountain erupting in a catastrophic volcanic explosion. It freaked him out. He raced back to his car and drove down the steep curving mountain road. And after driving for a while, he comes around a corner. And this is when Frank sees two figures, a man and a woman. And they were unusual, both in appearance and dress. They were dressed in dirty white robes and were standing right alongside the road. And Frank thir first thought they might be Hare Krishnas, but it was odd to him because they were, they were so far from any town. So he pulls the car over and offers them a ride, and up, getting close to them, he sees that these two figures are very strange. First of all, they are absolutely <laughs> far taller than any human being, unusually tall. Um, Frank's not sure how tall they were, but mm, he says it could have been nine, even ten feet. And he had asked them if they wanted to ride to town, and the female figure turns to her partner and says to him, her partner, I thought we were supposed to meet someone here. At this point, the man replies that Frank was actually, quote, the contact that they were waiting for. It was funny because at this point another car drove up and stopped and asked Frank if he was all right. And Frank had the weird impression that the occupants of this other car could not see the two strange figures he was talking to. So Frank said he was fine and just pulled over to admire the scenery and this other car drove off and Frank invited these two strangers into his car. <laughs> Now Frank was driving a little Volkswagen Beetle and seeing how tall these strangers were, he wondered if he had made a mistake offering them a ride. But to his shock, as if reading his mind, the man said, well fit fine. And as he watched, these two figures appeared, says Frank, to shrink down to normal size and they climbed into the back seat. So he pulls onto the road and he's driving along and he pulls out a beer and begins to drink. At this point he's wondering if the figures in his car might be angels and he turns around to examine them and he was amazed to see that they had six fingers on their hands. Now the male figure at this point t talks to Frank and says turn around and watch the road. <laughs> Frank assured the man that he was a good driver but the man then asked Frank what he was drinking and Frank said it was a beer with alcohol. And the man said, alcohol, that's poison. Alcohol is going to cause you a lot of problems in your lifetime. This was a prediction that later turned out to be very much true. But Frank became increasingly curious about these two strange figures in the back of his car. And now instead of angels, he wondered if they might be extraterrestrials. And he really wondered how had they shrunk themselves in size. And looking at them again, he saw that they both looked like humans. They had long hair. He estimates that they were in their early 30s. So he starts talking to them, and he told them about his vision of Mount St. Helens exploding. And the man said that, yes, Frank was correct, and that the mountain would explode in 1980. And this man said, and I quote, about 60 to 70 people will die on the mountain when it erupts. And this prediction, of course, did turn out to be absolutely accurate. And Frank was really intrigued at this point and just asked him flat out, Who are you? The woman turned to her companion and said, Should we tell him who we are? 
And the men said, No. Then turned to Frank and said, We are watchers. So Frank asked them their names, and the man gave him his name. Um, it's hard to pronounce, but I will try. The man said, My name is Gerus Yamein. And the woman said, My name is Isyu. So this was the uh, main part of the experience. Uh, actually, Frank completely forgot about this experience, or at least part of it, for years. He wanted to ask them more questions, but for some reason he didn't fully understand. He didn't. And it was about 10 miles outside of Toledo, Washington, when the gentleman said, Pull over here. When we get out, don't look back. So Frank pulled over. The strange hitchhikers exited his vehicle, and Frank pulled back onto the highway. And despite the man's request for Frank not to look back, he did. And he saw these two hitchhikers, these figures, grow back to about 10 feet in height and then promptly disappear. And to this day, he wonders, he believes, that he gave a ride to two extraterrestrials. Such a bizarre case. I really don't know what to make of some of these. But there are so many. And another case, really probably my favorite, occurred to a gentleman who was initially anonymous. He's now stepped forward. His name is Steve Boucher. He is a Canadian musician and he had an encounter in 1973 with his fellow bandmates with an extraterrestrial hitchhiker and this was outside of Jordan, Ontario in Canada. The case of Steve Boucher was originally investigated by Canadian researcher Graham Conway, though Steve Boucher would later write a book about his encounters. And at the time that he first talked to investigators, he gave the name, the pseudonym Tom Campbell, but has since come forward and given his real name, which again is Steve Boucher. And Steve says that late one evening in 1973, he and his friends and fellow musicians had just finished a gig in Jordan, Ontario, this is in Canada, and began to pack up their gear. And while doing so, a stranger approached them and asked for a ride home. By the way, the, uh, his band at the time was called Harmony Grove. So, Steve and his friends agreed to give the man a ride. They headed down the road, and here's where it gets weird. Instead of taking their planned route, they turned off on a service road bordering the Queen Elizabeth Highway and Lake Ontario. And after driving for a while, they approached the Charles Paley Park area uh, where there was a restaurant by the name of the Lake House Restaurant. And they could see lights up ahead on the road. And Steve and his friends thought it might be a vehicle accident. And uh, everyone in the back of the car <laughs> Uh, was peering and the driver said I think you all better take a look at this so they all peered through the windshield and were amazed to see that it was not a car accident it was a classic flying saucer landed on the road right in front of them so at this point the driver freaked out and tried to turn the van around but said he was unable to do so and at that moment, the van actually started to float sideways towards the saucer. Uh, they tried applying the brakes, but that had no effect. Steve had the impression that the van was actually no longer touching the road. And it floated towards this craft and stopped about 30 feet away from it. And the drummer called out. He says, do you see that? I don't believe it. Somebody's getting out of that thing. And at this point, all of the men saw small figures with pale skin and large, dark eyes exit the craft and surround the van. At this point, the strange hitchhiker, they still didn't know who he was, opened the van door and the small figures entered the vehicle. In fact, they were so short they could stand fully erect inside the van. At this point, Steve found himself paralyzed, but he could see these figures they had no ears, a very small mouth, 
and cream colored skin. He said they had three fingers on each hand and Steve heard one of these beings speaking telepathically and one of these figures told Steve that they had rendered him unable to move because he was thinking of attacking them, which Steve says he was thinking that. The figure then said that they would not harm him or his band members and that their mission was peaceful. They only wanted to examine the men. So Steve and two of his friends were then taken inside the object through an oval-shaped doorway. Inside this craft they saw three chrome-colored cots, beds, and they were instructed to undress and lay down on these beds, which they did. Steve and the others were then examined by the figures using what looked like dental-like instruments and probes. At one point one of the beings shown an instrument on Steve's body which allowed them to view his internal organs. They were then separated into different rooms where samples were apparently taken. And Steve started asking them questions like, Who are you? <laughs> and the ETs said that they were extraterrestrials, but they did have bases on Earth, including beneath Lake Ontario. Everyone was asking them questions. Uh, Steve asked them about Earth's religions and which one was correct. The ETs seemed surprised by the question and replied, and I quote, there is no correct religion on Earth. So that's what they told him. Uh, this was not a scary experience for Steve. In fact, he felt strong feelings of kinship and love towards the ETs. And he became actually tearful when it was time to go. He ended up giving them a gift. He gave them his flute, which they took. And afterwards, they were returned to their van and resumed their journey. The hitchhiker at this point was gone. And as often happens when one of these types of encounters occurs, nobody spoke. They did not mention it at all. And in fact, by the time they arrived home, Steve and the others had no memory whatsoever of being taken on board. And it wasn't until years later that Steve's memories were recalled using hypnotic regression. Steve, by the way, is a contact D. He has had encounters since he was a little boy, so have his relatives, his parents. Uh, Steve did write a book about his encounters called Beyond the Extraterrestrial Firewall. And he says that he did have further communication with this strange extraterrestrial hitchhiker but you'll have to read his book I don't want to give it away uh, if you want to learn more about that check out his book it's really quite good again it's called Beyond the Extraterrestrial Firewall and it's quite an unusual case of an extraterrestrial hitchhiker a really unusual case yeah if you're interested in learning more about that definitely check out Steve Boucher's book and if you don't believe that case, there's always another one after it. And here's another one. This occurred to two uh, ladies. The main witness is Edmona Toes and her friend Nuria Hansen. This occurred when they were driving in, near the area of Steamboat Mountain in British Columbia, Canada. And this occurred on October 18, 1974. These cases do seem to have very high levels of strangeness. And consider this next account, account which first appeared in the magazine Fate. Uh, this was written by Edmona Toes, and she titles the article, The UFOs That Led Us Home. So again, it was October 18, 1974, when Edmona and her friend Nuria were driving along the highway at the summit of Steamboat Mountain in British Columbia, Canada, when they saw two strange lights ahead of them on the highway. One appeared to be resting actually on the side of the mountain, but the other, which was three times the apparent size of a full moon, flew towards them, then darted up in the sky and hovered ahead of them. And looking at the light on the mountain, 
They could see that this was a craft. It appeared to be a craft with portholes shaped very much like a derby hat. So they pulled over to watch and actually waited for 45 minutes to see if anything would happen. And finally something did. The slanted UFO rose upward, flew 150 feet, and then landed again. At this point a trucker drove by and seeing the UFO, he stopped, exited his vehicle to gaze at the objects for a short uh, period of time, and then continued on his way. So at this point, Edmona and Nuria also continued driving. The weather wasn't good at this time. It was very foggy, and the road was quite icy. And Edmona reports that something else seemed to be controlling her vehicle, moving them along the highway at about 25 miles per hour. This does turn up in UFO cases. People feel like the UFOs are taking over their car. And this is exactly what Edmona is describing. And it was then that they again noticed a bright cloud-like object hovering only about 20, maybe 30 feet over their car. And it remained there for the entire duration of their trip. And what was really interesting is this was quite a long ride. Edmona noticed that her gas gauge showed that no fuel was being used. Uh, so they continued along the highway. Evening arrived and they stopped at a lodge at Muncho Lake, a very popular tourist destination. Although the lodge was closed, they were approached by a young man with dark hair and a beard. Uh, although the temperature was near zero, this weird gentleman wore no jacket, only a shirt, pants, and shoes. And he approached them and asked for a ride. And the woman declined, pointing out that their car was fully packed with belongings and that there was no room for him. Which was true. There was only room in the driver's seat and the front passenger seat. Despite this, this man somehow persuaded them to give him a ride. And since there was no room, he actually <laughs> sat on Nuria's lap in the front passenger seat. And here's where Strange goes to truly bizarre, because at one point Nuria realized that this man was not exerting any weight on her. In fact, he seemed to be floating about an inch above her lap. And she commented on this, but the man kind of just made a vague response. And Edmona also noticed this. I mean, she saw that this guy was actually hovering a few inches above Nuria's lap. And she reached out and verified this by reaching her hand and checking. <laughs> uh, so at this point, they're both puzzled. They feel strangely okay with what's going on at the same time, a little bit sedated. But Edmona asks the man what his name was. And he stared deeply into her eyes and replied, Gordon. Both women felt like he looked slightly familiar, but they couldn't place him. So they just continued this drive with this weird gentleman. Uh, it was, again, a pretty long drive, and they stopped for the evening at an inn. It's called the Fireside Inn. It's a hotel in northern British Columbia. They all stepped out of the car, and at this point, Gordon inexplicably vanished. He was gone. Shocked, the two of them looked around and called his name, but sure enough, he was gone. And this is when they noticed a very strange detail. There was snow all over the ground, untouched snow. And there were no tracks at all leading away from the car. So this seemed to be impossible. They went inside the hotel. They found another truck driver there who was absolutely shocked to see them. And when they told him that they had just come 165 miles from Steamboat Mountain, he didn't believe them and said that that was impossible as the road conditions made that route absolutely impassable. So something was going on there. The strangeness continued the next morning as they continued their trip, because again, as they drove along the road, this strange glowing cloud-like object returned and hovered above their car. And although the weather was blizzarding, the road, they said, seemed to be dry and free of snow in front of them. And at some point during their trip, their car engine mysteriously failed. 
They said two mysterious gentlemen showed up, seemed to know all about the two women and their trip, and actually helped them restart their car. And then they left in, under mysterious circumstances. So the two women drove up into Alaska to Edmona's home in Anchorage, Alaska, and it was only then that this glowing cloud-like object above their car disappeared. So a very strange series of events, which Edmona did write about in Fate magazine. And it was only uh, later, after this incident, that she realized that this strange hitchhiker did in some ways have an appearance similar to her husband. But she doesn't know what's going on here. After reviewing the entire journey, they finally came to the conclusion that Gordon was either an angel, or more likely, given that she had seen UFOs, an extraterrestrial. So yeah, again, she wrote this up in Fate magazine in an article titled, The UFOs That Led Us Home. So yeah, make of that case what you will. It's a very interesting case, and here's yet another. This current case took place somewhere in the deserts of Arizona. The exact location wasn't specified. Uh, but this case occurred to two ladies. One of them is named Lois. The other is her friend Gina. And this occurred in 1978. This next case comes from researcher Brad Steiger. Again, it occurred in November of 1978 to Lois and her friend Gina. Lois was a church-going businesswoman from Arizona and was driving with her friend Gina from Denver, Colorado to Phoenix, Arizona. And they were on a remote section of highway in Arizona when they saw a hitchhiker. Now mind you, there's nothing around here. There are no towns. This is just an isolated section of desert highway. And here's this gentleman, which they described as being very handsome, clean shaven, with long blonde hair, brilliant sky blue eyes, and he was wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. Now Lois is not in the habit of picking up hitchhikers. Uh, she had never picked up a hitchhiker before, in fact. And being two women alone on a highway, this was not something that they would normally have done. But Lois said she felt strangely compelled to slow down and stop. She couldn't help herself. And this man leaned in the window and spoke in a soft, musical voice and said... And I quote, I'm so glad you've come. We've been waiting for you. So Gina was absolutely entranced by this gentleman. As she says, As crazy as it sounds, it was as if I had known him all my life. Gina is usually kind of shy around strangers, especially males. But she was smiling from ear to ear, as if she was greeting an old friend. So both the women seemed to be in some ways hypnotized, if you will, or entranced by this guy who enters the car and begins to speak to them in soft, soothing, musical tones. And suddenly, to their amazement, their car is actually levitated off the highway and floated into a large craft hovering pretty high up there overhead. Next thing they know, they are inside the craft. And I'll just let Lois describe what happened next. As Lois says, Gina and I were separated, and I didn't see her again for quite a while. The beautiful hitchhiker disappeared, and I was surrounded by smallish entities with large, staring eyes. Their mouths were straight lines that I never saw open, but I seemed to hear voices, perhaps by telepathy. Lois found herself obeying docilely, as if hypnotized, as the beings undressed her and instructed her to lay down on the table. The beings then examined her, took samples of her blood, her skin, her hair. Uh, she had the sense that they were interested in the fact that she was infertile. But they also seemed to be very interested in their possessions as well, her purse and so forth. And as Lois says, they still seemed to be examining my clothing, my purse, everything that I had with me. I had been really nervous when the hitchhiker brought us aboard the space vehicle, but he kept saying over and over that Gina and I had nothing to fear, that they would not hurt us. 
So after this exam, Lois was taken to another room where she sat on what appeared to be a comfortable sofa facing a large window which showed a panorama of stars. An old bearded man, human looking, entered and told Lois that she had been contacted because she was one of them and that she would remember all of this in the fullness of time. Lois asked them why she had been examined and the being replied, to see how you are, to see if you are well. And she said, well, why do you care about me? And the man replied, because you have the key. That puzzled Lois, so she asked him, what key do I have? And he said, you will remember when the time is right. The next thing Lois and Gina know, they're back on the highway, in their car, on the road. They were both hungry, thirsty, and somewhat dazed. They drove silently into the next town, and here's where they got an incredible shock. Uh, they called their families and friends who were frantic with worry and told them that they were missing for five days. So this is very much like the Travis Walton case. It's very unusual for people to be missing that long, but this is what happened to Lois and Gina. Now following this event, Gina absolutely refused to talk about it. Lois said her home became stricken with poltergeist-like activity. And in fact, her children began reporting bedroom visitations by strange entities. This activity became so intense, it caused friction with her marriage. And Lois's husband actually divorced her. The weird activity continued, and in the mid-1980s, Lois's youngest daughter, uh, who was four years old, told Lois, and I quote, Mommy, it won't be long now before the hitchhiker comes back to see you. That really shocked Lois, as she had not told anyone about her encounter. And that's where this case uh, rests. I don't know anything more about this encounter. Brad Steiger never revealed anything else. As of 1988, this hitchhiker has not returned. So, I don't know. But as you can see in a number of these cases, these hitchhikers appear, and the next thing people know, they are being taken on board. Not always. I love these cases. They're so strange. And it's interesting that there's a number of them that have occurred in the state of Arizona. Because here's another one. This one occurred outside of Yuma, Arizona. This is in 2004. And the main witness is a retired anonymous airline pilot. It's a very unusual case. This case comes from Jan Harzan a UFO researcher and actually the former executive director for MUFON. And in 2004, Jan Harzan says he received an intriguing call from a retired airline pilot. This pilot is uh, no slouch. I mean, he's got an impressive resume with more than 40,000 hours of flying time. And again, this encounter occurred uh, when the pilot picked up a hitchhiker about 15 miles outside of Yuma, Arizona. And I'll just quote Jan Harzan here. As Jan Harzan says, he, the pilot, found it strange that this man was out in the middle of nowhere, literally out in the middle of the desert, standing on the side of the road with his thumb out. He normally did not pick up hitchhikers, but something told him to stop and give this guy a ride. So this is very similar to the previous case I just cited. Anyway, the hitchhiker told the pilot that he was looking for a ride to San Diego, California. This surprised the pilot and because that's where he was going. And this is what he told the gentleman, the hitchhiker, that he was actually heading to that city. And as they spoke, the hitchhiker revealed something incredible. He said flat out that he was an extraterrestrial, that this was not his normal form, and that he was in disguise. He said he had come to help humankind and was on his way to a research facility in San Diego. Now, Jan Harzen again spoke with this uh, pilot, the main witness, and said that this gentleman was absolutely sincere. 
And the witness said that being next to this man, this ex alleged extraterrestrial hitchhiker, he felt this really weird, strange calmness. And that at the time of this encounter, everything that the man said sounded, quote, rational and reasonable. It's a really weird case. And Jan Harzen is perfectly aware of this. As Jan Har Harzan wrote about this case, he says, I know, I know, sounds crazy, but it would be even crazier not to get to the facts, and we'll see where this one goes. Unfortunately, there is no further information on this case, but it does fit in with these other cases of extraterrestrial hitchhikers. Not a lot of details to that case. Some cases have more details than others. Here's a case that, which does have considerable detail. This occurred in the town, outside of the town of Mishor. This is in Crimea, Ukraine. And this occurred on July 25th, 2001, to a young lady by the name of Irina and her father. It was on the evening of July 25, 2001, when Irina and her father were driving near the town of Mishor. Again, this is along the southern coast of Crimea in Ukraine. They had just stopped to pick up some food and water when they saw what they described as a handsome young man hitchhiking along the highway. And in fact, Irina in particular found herself absolutely mesmerized by this gentleman's perfectly proportioned features. She described him as being tall, blonde-haired, and very attractive. And she began to beg her father to give this hitchhiker a ride. And for whatever reason, her father agreed. They pulled over, and this man got in the car and sat in the back seat. And as they started to drive off, they saw that this man was behaving strangely. First, he held this strange box-shaped box device in his hands, and then he began to mumble unintelligibly to himself, almost as if he was speaking a different language. So here he is. He has a strange appearance. He's got this weird box device. He's talking this strange language. This freaked Irina's father out, and he immediately pulled over and told the man to get out. Well, the man did not comply. Instead of exiting the car, he grabbed Irina's hair, pulled her head back, and pressed this box-like device against her back. And at this moment, both Irina and her father says that they became paralyzed, weak, and dazed. They could not control themselves at this point. The hitchhiker exited the car, sat down on a log, and began to speak into this black box. Both Irina and her father said that they were fearful, they wanted to leave, but were still unable to move. The man then returned to the car, which now began to move by itself. So again, here we see a car being controlled uh, beyond the control of the people who are supposed to be driving it. <laughs> Uh, at this point, Irina and her father both noticed a white glowing light surrounding their car. And after traveling along the highway for a short distance, their car stopped by itself near an abandoned gas station. The hitchhiker again exited the car and began collecting plant samples from the ground. <laughs> Very strange. Again, typical ET behavior. He then approached the car and, speaking in Russian, said, Thank you. The man then disappeared into a beam of light, which turned green as it arced over the front of their vehicle, and both Irina and her father promptly lost consciousness. They woke up the next morning, and here's another very strange detail. Following this encounter, Irina noticed this very strange after effect. Her eyes, which had been brown since birth, were now green in color. And I know how that must sound, but I actually do have another case just like that where someone's eye color changed following an encounter. 
I think you'll agree, like all these other cases, that one is quite unusual. But of all the cases I found, I think this one is probably the most unusual because the gentleman that this driver picked up was clearly not human. This case occurred outside of Limeira. This is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It occurred on June 12, 2003. And the main witness is a gentleman by the name of Mr. Zilnerman. This very bizarre encounter again occurred on June 12, 2003 outside of Limeira in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It was very early in the morning, 6.20 a.m., when Mr. Zilmerman had left home to go to his place of employment. He had just passed through the toll gate on the highway when he saw a strange-looking figure hitchhiking alongside the road. He knew it was risky to pick up random strangers, but as happens in other cases of this kind, he found himself compelled to stop the car and pick this figure up. By the way, this case is covered in the book E.T.'s in Brazil by researcher author Antonio Falero. So moving along with the story, this figure approached the car and Zilmerman surprised himself by rolling down his window and he could now see that this figure had large sort of cat-like eyes, a very small nose, a bald head, and he was exuding this strange, powerful odor. And this stranger, this hitchhiker, pointed towards the city of Parasicaba, ahead of them on the road, and then entered the car. Now, Mr. Zilmerman, at this point, was nearly overcome by the strange odor of this man and looked at him to examine him more closely and saw that this man was quite short, about five feet tall, had a very pale complexion, sort of an oily complexion, and wore a strange, tight-fitting outfit with strange, thick-soled shoes. So again, we see these figures have a strange appearance and are dressed strangely. So Mr. Zilmerman asks this figure, where do you want to go? And the hitchhiker remained silent, but pointed ahead on the highway. Mr. Zilmerman asked him, what is your name? And again, this figure didn't answer. But at this point, Mr. Zilmerman could see that this man's eyes appeared to turn really dark black. And this really frightened him. He continued down the highway. He felt compelled to. And this is when the man began emitting loud croaking noises. So very similar in some ways to what Irina described. And at this point, Mr. Zilmerman looked at this figure more closely and noticed other odd details. This man's hands had six fingers and they were tipped with black, pointed, almost claw-like fingernails. And getting a closer look at the man's complexion, he saw that it was slick and almost oily in appearance. He tried again to talk to this figure, but the hitchhiker remained totally silent and after each question that Mr. Zilmerman asked, this man's eyes would flash this dark black color. Finally, they reached the outskirts of the town of Parasicaba, and this is when Mr. Zilmerman felt compelled to stop the car. This strange figure exited the vehicle, actually smiled at Mr. Zilmerman, crossed the road in front of him, and disappeared into the bushes. There's nothing around here, so it's not clear where this figure was going to go. Mr. Zilmerman drove off, and he said that the only other effect from the encounter, other than being absolutely puzzled by it, was a severe headache. Moving along, here's yet another case. I'm telling you, there's a lot of cases like this. There must be something to this. This next case occurred near Salisbury, Virginia. The main witness is anonymous, but goes by the initials O.B., and this occurred in 2004. So this case does involve a gentleman who is anonymous. As I said, his initials are O.B., and it occurred near Salisbury, Virginia, around 2004, when Mr. O.B. saw a man alongside the highway wearing a thin topcoat. 
Now this was a freezing cold day and OB was concerned so he stopped to give the man a ride. And the man got in the car and OB saw that this man was quite young, had blonde hair. He immediately climbed into the car and said that the van, the inside of the car, was uncomfortably hot and complained about it several times. So OB suggested that the man go ahead and remove his coat, which the man did. And this is when OB got a shock because the man had nothing on under his coat. <laughs> he was nude. Uh, this shocked OB and he asked the man where he was from and the man replied in kind of a strange manner, I'm from Venice. And OB wasn't sure he heard this correctly and asked, Venice, California? And the man replied, yeah, California. So <laughs> OB thought that was curious because the man had a strange tone to his voice that he said was difficult to describe. But the man did have a message for OB and he began talking about how Earth's governments were taking the sides of corporations instead of the common people. And this was purposeful with the intention of causing a financial collapse. He talked quite a bit about this sort of thing, made several other political predictions. Uh, but O.B. was more puzzled by this man's strange behavior, speech, and appearance. And he kept staring at him and looking at him. Because he says this man's face was oddly different than a normal human. He had abnormally large, bright blue eyes and very long, very thin blonde hair. And it, it was at this point that he wondered if this man was in fact an extraterrestrial or some kind of supernatural creature. Uh, so after, at some point he pulled the car over, the man exited the vehicle and warned the witness not to tell anyone what he had been told. Now the witness says he dropped this man off on Fairground Road outside of Salisbury, Virginia. And as an interesting end note to this case, he later heard that a couple claimed that they had actually been abducted into a UFO on that very road. OB says he never saw any UFO, but to this day he wonders if he encountered an alien hitchhiker. And he says that on another occasion he was driving with his wife along this same stretch of road and saw what appeared to be the same figure in the same exact place he had seen him before. The only difference was that instead of wearing a thin top coat, this strange man was wearing a silvery white jumpsuit. And remembering his earlier encounter with this very strange hitchhiker, he didn't stop this time and just drove by the man. Yeah, truly a bizarre case. Um, I love this next case. Um, this case is undated, so I don't know when it exactly happened, but it involves a Native American gentleman by the name of Dakota, and this again occurred in the state of Arizona. It's a really interesting case. This next case comes from Artie Six Killer Clark and again involves a Native American gentleman by the name of Dakota who one evening was driving along State Highway 191 between Window Rock and Chinle, Arizona. This is a remote desert area and this is not a long drive. It normally takes about one hour. It was around midnight when Dakota came upon a man standing alongside the road and he first thought it was another Native American which was not unusual, and as he usually does when he sees a fellow Indian walking along the highway, Dakota stopped to give the man a ride. And as Dakota says in his own words, at the time, I didn't know he was an alien. That's what I think he was, but I thought he was an Indian when I picked him up. Very quickly, however, Dakota realized his mistake. As Dakota says, when he got into the car, I noticed he was not dressed like an Indian. Indians around here wear jeans, denim jackets, neither a t-shirt or a shirt. It was a cold night. It was snowing, and he wasn't wearing a jacket. He was wearing something like coveralls, but it was a strange material. 
It seemed to glow in the lights of the dashboard. And when I asked him where he was headed, he pointed ahead without saying a word. So here we see this pattern again. A strange looking figure, wearing strange clothes, acting strangely. Dakota thought this was strange, but wondered if perhaps the man was Navajo, who are sometimes more private than the people of his own tribe. So he continued driving until coming over a small hill, at which point he came upon a blinding light ahead of him. He thought it might be a semi-truck, and without warning, Dakota's car engine failed. He was trying to restart it when the hitchhiker exited the vehicle and walked into the brilliant light ahead of them on the road. Moments later, the hitchhiker returned with another man and told Dakota to go with them. As Dakota says, at first I thought it was a joke, but then I felt like I had no choice. Not only that, I felt like I had no will. So Dakota became worried about his car parked in the middle of the highway, but these men told him it would be all right, and the next thing he knew, they walked into this light, which turned out to be a spacecraft, a UFO, landed on the center of the highway. And on board this craft, Dakota saw many other Native Americans. He tried to speak with them, in fact, but all of them, he said, seemed to be dazed, almost entranced. Dakota examined the men who had taken him on board, and as Dakota says, they were about as tall as me, but much slimmer. They wore a type of jumpsuit with a silver triangle on the chest. They looked like humans, but they were fairer. I remember seeing their hand against my skin. Their fingers were so long and white. Dakota said he was taken from the room with the other Indians to another room and then was left alone. He became frightened and exam exited the room, running down the corridor trying to escape, at which point he did become paralyzed. As Dakota says, I remember thinking I am stronger than these guys because they were so slight of build, but I was wrong. They rendered me helpless, and after that I don't know what happened. The next thing I remember is being back in my car. So back in his car, he started up the engine and drove into town, and this drive, which should have taken one hour, actually took four hours. Dakota says that the next morning his body felt very sore, but worse than that, he was more emotionally shaken than physically. And as Dakota says, I believe I picked up an alien along the side of the road, thinking I was picking up a Navajo. But it taught me one thing. I am more careful about picking up strangers. And following this, Dakota was picked up at least twice after this, and he says each encounter lasted about four hours. I love that case. It's clearly not involving a human being. I'm telling you, there are extraterrestrials thumbing rides along highways across the United States and the world. And here's another case from Artie Six Killer Clark. I love her as a researcher. She's introducing some really interesting cases, I think. And this next one occurred outside of Guatemala City. It involves three brothers and their cousin. And again, this case is not dated, so I don't know when it occurred. But yeah, once we get into the details of this one, you'll see that this is a whopper. I mean, this is a really unusual case. The three brothers in this case go by the names Elicio, Javier, and Jose, and their cousin is named Miguel. And again, this occurred, occurred in Guatemala City in Guatemala, and they had just attended the wedding reception of their sister. Afterwards, they loaded up their van with the chairs and tables that had been borrowed and need to be, needed to be returned to their owner. The wedding reception was over. Nearly all the guests had already left. And as the four men were preparing to leave, they were approached by a young man who asked them for a ride. Now this looked like a normal person. He was tall, slender, dressed in jeans, a white shirt, and a cowboy hat that was pulled low over his eyes. And they all thought that he was perhaps a friend of the bridegroom, and they agreed to give him a ride. 
So they all climbed into the van and headed down the road. Jose was driving, and as Jose says, instead of following the main highway, I took a service road that led around the city. It was strange because I had never taken that road, and yet I felt compelled to choose that road. That's the same thing that happened in other cases, so here's this weird pattern turning up again. And as they drove out of town, one of the front tires became flat. I wonder about this, too. They pulled over not far from a textile factory and proceeded to change the tire, and this is when they all noticed that the factory lights were out, which was very strange because they were always lit. They had almost finished changing the tire when they noticed two strange things. One was that their mysterious hitchhiker had inexplicably disappeared, and uh, another vehicle appeared about a half mile ahead of them. And then another brilliant light appeared behind them over the factory parking lot. And this is when they realized it was, in fact, a UFO. The four men became frightened and piled into the car. They tried to race away. Not surprisingly, the car engine would not start. So they tried to exit the car, but all four men said that they became paralyzed, unable to move. And Eliseo, the oldest brother, describes what happened next. As Eliseo says, That's when the hitchhiker reappeared. He was no longer dressed like the four of us. He was wearing a white one-piece suit, but the strangest thing of all, he was still wearing the cowboy hat. He opened the door and climbed into the passenger's seat. He told us not to fear. He closed the door and then the van began to move toward the craft. A bright light fell on the road in front of us and I felt the van move upward. All the time, the, the stranger is saying that we should not be afraid. The next thing that happens is the men found themselves on board the craft, which they said was brightly lit inside. Humanoid figures with light-colored brown hair and big, round, bright blue eyes surrounded them, placed them into a room, and began to take blood samples. That's all they really remembered? Actually, they didn't remember that, because the next thing the brothers knew, it was morning, and they were back in the van. Elicio woke first and had no idea what had happened. He couldn't recognize his brothers, he had no idea where he was or even his own name, who he himself was. Jose and Miguel lay unconscious in the back of the van, and Javier lay unconscious on the ground outside. So this was quite uh, unnerving to them, very concerning. They were very much dazed, very confused. Eliseo tried to flag down a driver for help, but the driver of the car fled, and shortly later the police arrived, so apparently he called the police, and brought them all to the police station. All of the men had profound amnesia. Only after a few days did they remember who they were and what had happened. As Javier says, we were on board a UFO, and we were led there by the hitchhiker. The three brothers all agree on the basic details of their on-board experience. Jose was the first to remember that they had been taken on board, but he actually had the least recall of the three of them, and it was really their cousin Miguel who remembered the most detail. He says that after they had been taken to a room and had blood samples taken, they were all separated and brought to different rooms. Miguel remembers being undressed and physically examined, and following this encounter, he actually slept for three days straight. And when he awoke, his memory slowly returned. He did find a strange round mark on the left side of his torso that hadn't been there before his encounter. And for him, this was further evidence that their encounter was entirely real. So again, this case comes from researcher Artie Sixkiller Clark, and as she says, and I quote, I have repeatedly been told about the paralysis that accompanied an abduction. It was only the third time, however, 
that a hitchhiker was involved who was actually an alien. It makes me wonder if this practice is more common than we know. I never pass a hitchhiker without thinking of Eliseo, Jose, Javier, and Miguel. Even if I am tempted to stop, I drive on. Those are pretty much all the cases I found. There is one more case I would like to cover. I'm really not sure what to make of this one. This occurred in Corsicana, Texas, along the Corsicana Highway. It was reported to MUFON by an anonymous truck driver. This actually was featured on a few paranormal reality TV shows. And what's interesting about this case is it involves an actual photograph of this alleged ET thumbing a ride along the Corsicana Highway. You can make up your own mind about it, but here's the case. So again, it was August 1st, 2018, when this anonymous truck driver was driving along the Corsicana Highway in Corsicana, Texas, one afternoon, when he says he saw a strange figure standing alongside the highway. And in his report to MUFON, the truck driver writes, and I quote, Witnessed person walking, dressed strangely. When I passed and looked at my mirror, it was gone. What makes this case interesting is that the driver had a dash cam video playing at the time and was able to capture several seconds of footage as he drove by this figure. And this video has gone viral on the internet. You could probably find it. And it does show what appears to be a greenish-gray humanoid figure with its face turned towards oncoming traffic and its arms extended, almost as if thumbing a ride. This did appear on the Travel Channel series Beyond the Unknown with host Don Wildman. It was featured in Season 2, but it does not appear to have been the product of an official investigation. Nevertheless, this video is somewhat intriguing, and I will say that this case does fit the pattern we have seen in other cases. So those are all the cases I could find, and that's quite a bit. I suspect there are more out there. I did cover these cases in my book, Not From Here, Volume 4, which again is all about the really unusual types of UFO cases. And you can't deny, <laughs> cases of extraterrestrial hitchhikers are really unusual. Very much like the vanishing hitchhiker syndrome, only involving apparent extraterrestrials. Really cool. It kind of reminds me of that book by Douglas Adams, the science fiction novel called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. So yeah, I think this is a good thing to keep in mind if you're driving along the highway and you see someone dressed up in a silver suit or someone with big staring eyes and no hair and a huge head thumbing a ride. Uh, I <laughs> don't know how many cases there are like this, but the 12 or 13 I present here, I do believe, are just the tip of the iceberg. Because if this happened to you, would you tell someone? Something to be aware of in case you're driving along and you see somebody <laughs> looking very unusual. So that's the show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's definitely an unusual one. I want to thank you very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers. Keep asking questions. And most importantly, keep having fun. Bye now.